Well, good afternoon. I am uh, David McGinty, a Canadian Member of Parliament and Chair of the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, or as we call it here, ENSICOP. ENSICOP is Canada's parliamentary review body for national security and intelligence issues. Today, I'd like to shed some light on the genesis and the inner workings of our committee. Before I begin, I want to clarify that what I mean when I say review. In a Canadian context, review is different from oversight. When we think of oversight, I'm referring to the control that a minister has over an organization. Review refers to an independent, outside, and often retroactive examination of an organization or an issue with the aim of strengthening a system or improving a practice going forward. With that, let me start with when, why, and how ENSICOP was created. ENSICOP was established in June of 2017 with the passing of the ENSICOP Act, and its first members were appointed in November of that year. The creation of the committee was part of the government's broader legislative agenda to adapt Canada's national security review framework as a result of some pretty significant changes. Over the last several decades, Canadian security and intelligence organizations have grown significantly and have been given new and stronger powers. They share more information and they cooperate closely. However, Canada's framework to review national security and intelligence organizations and their activities had not adapted to these changes. In fact, before INSACOP was established in 2017, only three security and intelligence organizations had dedicated review bodies, and none of those review bodies could examine issues beyond the confines of their assigned agency. Moreover, Canadian parliamentarians did not have the ability to review national security and intelligence issues at a classified level, unlike our allies in the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, France, and elsewhere. The ENSICOP Act was designed to fill those gaps. First, it gave parliamentarians the necessary clearances to conduct reviews based on highly classified information. Second, it created a body that could look across the organizations that make up Canada's security and intelligence community, and also examine various issues from the top of the crow's nest right down into the engine room. The legislation that created ENSICOP lays out clearly and in considerable detail the committee's composition, security obligations, mandate, and rights to information. I'll talk about each of those in turn. Members are appointed by the Prime Minister following his or her consultations with the leaders of political parties and groups in both Houses of Parliament. The committee is composed of up to 11 members, that is up to three non-elected senators and eight members of parliament. No more than five members of parliament can be members of the governing party, ensuring that no government has a majority of members on the committee. The committee is dissolved when an election is called. This was the case last fall for our 2019 federal election and committee members must be appointed or reappointed within 60 days after Parliament returns. We operate at arm's length from both Parliament and from government. I'll turn now to security. Membership on this committee is a very big responsibility. All of us were subjected to security checks, swear an oath, and we are permanently bound to secrecy. We are clear to see the most classified information, and we would be subject to criminal sanctions if we inappropriately disclosed information, including in Parliament, because each of us are required to waive our parliamentary privilege. ENSICOP has a broad and strategic mandate. We can review the overall framework for national security and intelligence in Canada, including legislation, regulations, policy, administration, 
and finances. We can also examine any activity carried out by a department that relates to national security or intelligence. And finally, we can review any matter relating to national security or intelligence that a minister refers to the committee, including, of course, the prime minister. In order to do this work, we are entitled to receive any information related to our mandate, with three exceptions. We cannot see material which cabinet uses to make decisions known as cabinet confidences. We cannot know the identity of confidential sources or of protected witnesses. And we can't have information related to ongoing law enforcement investigations that may lead to prosecutions. Now allow me to discuss what we do and how we do it. Our act requires us to submit an annual report to the Prime Minister presenting the reviews we conducted over the previous year and our associated findings and recommendations. We can also submit a special report at any time if the committee feels that an issue, activity or event warrants its attention. In our first year of operations, before we got started on any reviews, we settled on some broad objectives to guide how and why we do this work and why we undertake specific work. First, we want our findings and recommendations to strengthen security and intelligence organizations, both in effectiveness and in accountability, because the fundamental role of parliamentarians is to hold the government to account on issues of critical importance to Canadians. That means their security, and also, that means their fundamental rights. Second, we hope our reports help inform all 38 million Canadians on the activities of the security and intelligence organizations that must, by necessity, conduct much of their work in secret. In short, we think that transparency strengthens accountability. Early in our operations, we also established some criteria to help us decide what topics and what issues to review. Some of the key criteria include, first, whether the organization or the issue was previous, previously subject to review. Second, how the activities are governed, for example, by specific legislation or other formal government direction. And third, the extent to which an activity or issue implicated the privacy or democratic rights of Canadians. We try to conduct at least two reviews each year. A framework review that examines a major national security and intelligence related issue that cuts across multiple organizations. And an activity review that hones in on the specific activities of a department or agency. Once we decide on the topics, our review process starts. Over the course of several months, we submit document requests, conduct independent open source research, and analyze tens of thousands of pages of highly classified information. We also hold hearings with high level officials. We always meet in private, and consult with a wide range of experts and civil rights groups through the course of our work. Once we have all the information we need for a review, members are engaged in a detailed deliberative process and ultimately develop findings and recommendations. I'm proud to say that the committee operates by consensus in all of its work. In conducting its reviews, the committee is supported by its secretariat. The Secretariat is staffed with subject matter experts, researchers, and legal counsel. They are public servants, not political or parliamentary staff, and their role is to support, advise, and guide us throughout the review process. As I mentioned earlier, we submit our reviews directly to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister then has 30 sitting days to table the report in Parliament. Before being tabled in Parliament, our reports are redacted for information that may be injurious to national security, defense, 
or international relations. The government cannot make any other changes to our reports on any other grounds, for example, in order to hide embarrassing or critical information. In our first three years of operation, we produced two annual reports and two separate special reports containing a total of seven reviews. Our reviews have covered a wide range of issues from the intelligence activities of our armed forces and our border services agency to the threat posed by foreign interference in Canadian democracy. As I mentioned earlier, ENSACOP was reconstituted in February 2020 following the 2019 federal election. The new iteration of our committee was just finding its footing when the pandemic hit. We had to adjust our work plan for the year, but we now have two important reviews underway. A review of the government's cyber defense activities and a review of Global Affairs Canada's national security and intelligence activities. We will provide those reviews to the Prime Minister in 2021. I'll conclude with a few words on the value of parliamentary review and on ENSACOP's nonpartisan approach. I believe that ENSACOP is a powerful tool for accountability. It derives its power from both the breadth of its mandate and its freedom to determine its own review topics, but its power also comes from its composition. Parliamentarians are public figures whose role is to hold the government to account on behalf of everyday Canadians. ENSACOP members take their responsibility very seriously. Each of us comes with our political affiliations and beliefs. But when it comes to ENSACOP, we park our politics at the door. We are careful to ensure that our discussions, our interactions with security and intelligence officials, and our reviews and recommendations remain nonpartisan. We hope this approach not only strengthens accountability, but also the trust of Canadians in their national security institutions. Thank you very much for your attention.